the Self and Society podcast, exploring what it means to flourish as an individual and a community. This is your host, Ari Armstrong. Music by Jordan Smith, cjsclassical.com. Please join Self and Society at Substack. A couple of quick updates. I have moved my writing and podcast to Substack through Self and Society and Colorado Pickaxe. I continue to work on my next book, which is an editing. I'll announce more details soon. Our guest today is Robert Trzinski, author of the Trzinski Letter and Symposium at Substack, and author of the book, So Who is John Galt Anyway? A Reader's Guide to Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged. I also want to talk about current events and the objectivist movement. So welcome to the show, Robert. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this is, uh, this is really exciting. I really enjoyed your book. I appreciate that. I thought it was a really nice intro to the, to the novel. Yeah, it's, it's supposed to be, I, I, I tried to make it something that would be, have new ideas for people who are already familiar with it, but also be something that would be a good explainer for people who've just encountered it and are trying to chew through the, the big ideas in the novel for the first time. No, I think it succeeds. And I like the way that you bring in modern literature and modern political examples to discuss the, the novel in that way. If Ayn Rand were writing social criticism today, would she be more focused on the woke anti-capitalist left or the religious ethno-nationalist right? Oh, that's a great question, boy. Uh, now, I think, you know, the, the, if you look at what she was writing at the time, the answer would be both. She was very comfortable fighting a two-front war, so to speak, you know, because she would inveigh against uh, National Review, or I don't know if she ever did so much them by name, but that wing of the movement, I know she clashed with William F. Buckley. She, you know, wrote things titled with titles like conservatism an obituary uh in in the early 60s so she was she was had very comfortable criticizing the right but at the same time of course a lot of what she wrote was going hammer and tongs with the 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 pro-welfare state left and you know uh going after them about totally failing to understand the causes of inflation and, and all the different aspects of that so in her novels i think it's interesting that in her novels she goes after the i think the left more than the right and that's partly because you know uh the fountainhead was written in you know she started writing it in the late 30s in the middle of the red decade and so she was going after what was the the main trend among the intellectuals at that time it was the elsewhere Tui type that she had in mind and you know the the red decade intellectual who was uh, spreading collectivist ideas, uh, and in Atlas Shrugged, you know, the, given the 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 focus is on the attacks on capitalism, the attacks on free markets, it, it is to some extent uh, her focus was more on on the left, and I think it was partly because that was again in the fifties, the the conservative movement was really sort of collapsed at the time. Uh, what there what there was of it, I mean, uh, in the late fifties. William F. Buckley was just starting to sort of cobble it back together and rebuild it. I came across this recently, uh, um, looking at some of this history for an article I did, I think it was for the Bulwark, uh, on the history of the conservative movement. And, you know, I looked at, for example, at the, the American Mercury, which was, you know, major, major influential publication in the 1920s. H.L. Mencken was behind it. Uh, Henry Hazlitt, who was a friend of Ayn Rand's, uh, pro -free market, great pro-free market economist, had been one of the editors of it. Uh, very influential, big ideas, uh, important conservative publication. By the 19, late 1940s, I think it was, it had been bought out by a guy who basically had it plunged down into anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. And this sort of very John Birch Society type of thing, which is a very conspiratorial, very anti-intellectual. Uh, by the late 50s, they were, uh, who's this guy? Uh, George Lincoln Rockwell, the hit hired, you know, the, who's the, the neo-Nazi. So the American Mercury lived its last very obscure couple decades from the 50s to the 70s as a, a neo-Nazi publication. So you had this sort of collapse that had happened in the American right when she was at about the time in the late 40s and 50s when she was writing Atlas Shrugged. So in her fiction, I think she had much more of the focus on the, the apocalypse is going to come, essentially. The collapse of America is going to come from these mainstream uh, welfare state pro-regulation, basically New Deal types who were going to take over and impose a sort of a, a long slide into socialism, into totalitarian, into, into dictatorial socialism. And so she was much more focused on that. But in her nonfiction writing, she was very much aware of the, 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 the fact that this is a two front war from her perspective, that uh, as a somebody who's fighting for individualism and for reason, 
you had you know the the left and the right were both enemies of that i think that's something though that has become clearer in the last really in the last decade especially with the rise of the sort of nationalist conservatives in the last 5 to 7 years uh, and you know ones who are heavily influenced by the alt right and who are very openly anti individualist you know and individualism and individual freedom and liberalism in the in the sense that we would recognize as a correct sense in the sense of a, a belief in individual freedom that is what they regard very openly and explicitly as the enemy so the old fusionism where you know the free marketers and you know the Henry Hazlitts were going to be in there with the Russell Kirks, uh, and the free marketers were going to be in an alliance with the uh, religious conservatives. That's all collapsed, and that's no longer. I mean, it's, it's very clear now where the battle lines are drawn. That it's the religious conservatives versus individualism versus individual freedom. So, what do you think about this idea of fusionism? Some people are just saying that that yeah. is a dead letter. Some people are saying that it never should have. <laughs> There was never a fusion anyway. It was all a pretense. Where, where, how do you see that? Well, you know, that's it's a complicated thing. I think there was it wasn't just a pretense. I think there was a lot of overlap, and you know, it's there's an older generation of religious conservatives, and I think David French is like the last person I described as the last vestige of this. Right? Um, I used to guy, I, a, an author, a writer, I agree with an awful lot and get along with very well, uh, even though he's he's an evangelical Christian. Uh, but they were influenced by classical liberal ideas. And I think part of it, too, is I think the influence of Ayn Rand on conservatism is sometimes underestimated uh, when it's not being overhyped by the, by, the, by the left when they want to say, oh, well, these people are all Ayn Rand uh, fanatics. Uh, it is actually to this be underestimated on the right, because I remember when uh, there were recently some Atlas Shrugged movies that were done, and we can you know talk about the quality of the films. But the one thing I liked that I liked about the phenomenon of those films coming out is I remember that there was this moment where the first one of those came out and there was a sort of who's who of conservative intellectuals who came out basically as fans of the novel and fans of Ayn Rand. And it was like, you know, John Fund and, and um, Michael Medved and uh, it, it's mostly a, people above a certain age, unfortunately. But I think that what it showed is that there was this tremendous influence that she had, especially in the later years of the Cold War where her ideas and her, her analysis of individualism versus collectivism really seemed, especially, I guess, in, in the later years of the Cold War, it seems like a, a necessary and important answer to, uh, to collectivism on the left. And so therefore, I think she had a tremendous influence among conservatives. So I think that the fusion, old fusionism that was there was not entirely an illusion. Now, philosophically, it was, I think, un unsustainable. Because you can't have religious traditionalism, which is anti-individualist and anti-reason, that you know, and that and, and anybody who's been around in the liberty movement for a long time, as you and I have, uh, knows that that's always been this sort of bone of contention, this uncomfortable moment that comes up when you're dealing with anyone who's on the conservative end of things. That you know, they 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 see individualism as the problem, and it's always even when they accepted some Ayn Rand influence they still had that element that is inherent in their religious ideology, that individualism is the problem, people making their own choices is the problem, that we need to return to tradition and submit to religious, re religious authority. That's always been a sort of undercurrent of, the, of conservatism. So philosophically, I think the conflict has always been there. But there have been ideological versions of sort of religious, uh, neo, uh, religious classical liberalism that were more substantive. They actually built up arguments and, and, and um, you know, the, it's like what first things used to be in the Reagan era versus what it is now, that it was this attempt to sort of incorporate the ideas of free market economists, incorporate some of these individualist ideas and an idea for, yes, we need to, uh, we need to recognize the importance of the individual, incorporate that into a religious uh, theology and into a religious outlook. And it's like, and, and they were at least trying to do that, even if it was, like I said, in the long term, uh, philosophically unsustainable. And the difference now is, I think, that they're not trying anymore. They don't feel the need to try. Well, I notice in your book, you do frame objectivism on as being on the right. Yeah. And I guess the way I look at it is, 
if you look at the right as being concerned primarily with free markets, okay, then I can be on the right. But if it's in the in so far as it's conservative religion, evangelical religion, that's not for me. And it feels like the right has gone more strongly in that direction. Ironically, under Trump, who yeah. is anything but a Christian? Um, he's just a nihilist, a pragmatist nihilist. Yeah, so yeah. I thought that was. It, the right has always been a vague term. And I wrote that the book came out in 2019, but I wrote it over a period of about five years prior to that. So that's the one thing. I mean, for most of the time I was writing that, I was still working at the Federalist uh, and working, writing for the Federalist. And, uh, you know, it was more of the sense of, okay, we're all in this together, even if we disagree on things. And it became clearer as time went on that that wasn't the case. So, yeah, that's one thing. Uh, you know, the, the, the term right, and I, I've had, I had I did a podcast. I had George Will on for a podcast a while back, and we sort of debated this about you know the right or conservatism. And the thing is, it always it means something different in an American context than in a European context. Which is, in the European context, it tends to be you know blood and soil, throne and altar, very traditionalist. And in American context, if you're trying to conserve traditional Americanism, well, traditional Americanism is, it's the founding fathers, it's its John Locke, it's Thomas Jefferson. It's all sorts of things that that uh, are sort of proto-objectivists in a way. Uh, so the, the, having an individual, an, you know, good old American individualism, you know, so having an individualist pro-freedom outlook is much more compatible with being an American conservatism, conservative. But the thing is that what I think is happening now was we're trying to, we're getting a conservatism that is much more of a European style conservatism. What do you make of the fact that a substantial minority of self-identified objectivists have openly embraced Trumpism and some well-known objectivists even, have even rationalized, say, Putin's invasion of Ukraine? Well, you may have seen, I had a, a little session with Richard Salzman a while back who's, who's doing this. Now, he's very much in the, minor, in the minority on that among objectivists. I, I think, you know, going to the, to the Donald Trump thing, I, I think, you know, I'm still trying to puzzle through how that happens because, I mean, I, I, I can't read Atlas Shrugged without, and, and you know, as going for Mein Rand's philosophy, not just as a philosophy, but, you know, she concretized it with these characters, uh, concretized her outlook with these characters in her, in her novels. So I think it's very easy to ask sort of, you know, what would she think of Donald Trump? And the, the way to answer that is say, well, write him in as a character in Atlas Shrugged and see, and see where he ends up. Uh, in my book, I have a quote, somebody, um, I can't remember which, there's a blogger who did that. I think it may have been, uh, it's either All Pundit or Ace of Spades, one of those guys, who did a little write-up of, here's what Donald Trump would sound like as a character in an Ayn Rand novel. And you know, it's very clear that he's not one of the heroes. You know, it's like, oh, this guy reared and he doesn't know anything about medals. I order lots of medals. I know much more about medals than he does. And he, he, he comes across as, you know, it, it's totally realistic as Donald Trump's style of, of speaking and communicating. And of course he comes across as just a pompous blowhard and, and an ignoramus. Uh, I think that Ayn Rand would not have been very impressed with him. So I, it, it just on a sense of life level, I don't understand how you could, you know, enjoy Ayn Rand's novels and, and enjoy her characters and her heroes who are very self-controlled, very intellectual, very thoughtful people, and then admire Donald Trump. I, I think maybe some of it has to do, though, with the idea that you were talking about, you know, Ayn Rand and her novels uh, often took on the left much more than the right. And even if she attack them a lot in her, in her nonfiction uh, writings. That's, you know, perhaps a less influence on people. I think there are a lot of people who got very used to over decades, the idea that, well, we're closer to the right than to the left. The right may have maybe bad, it may have its faults, but the left is really horribly evil. So we have to oppose them. And I think they sort of got, at least part of the explanation here is a lot of them got programmed into their head the idea that the left is the real threat. They're the ones who are going to take us to the concentration camps and collapse of civilization. Whereas the right is you know, more or less on our side. And so therefore anyone who's on the right can't really be that bad. And they sort of, and you know, they developed the habit of watching Fox News <laughs> as, as part of that. And then of course, you know, if you're in the Fox News verse, you know, the world looks very different to you than it does if, if, uh, if you're outside of that media bubble. So I think, a lot of those people sort of, I think, I, what I've been trying to, unfortunately, drum people's head a little bit in my newsletter in the last five, six years is the idea that you have to readjust those expectations and realize that there is 
at least a wing of the right and of which Donald Trump is and, and Donald Trump is trying his best to make it the dominant wing uh, that is very much opposed to our values and is as much opposed to our values as as the left is. So sort of readjusting those expectations and getting people out of the media bubble of, you know, if you're consuming a lot of right wing media, you're going to get a very distorted view of the world. Well, to me, the key element of Donald Trump and Trumpism is anti-reality. I mean, mm. it, it's almost too much to say that Trump perpetually lies because he's not even going for the truth. Like there's no even there's not even any distinction but in his mind. It's just what can yeah. he say that will drum up his base and try to score political points? But there's an interesting section in your book where you cast Joe Biden as a villain in Atlas Shrugged. Well, so who's the as, more as one of the lighter villain? villains? Okay, so who's one of the who's the mo more obvious Atlas Shrugged villain, Donald Trump or Joe Biden? Well, I think Donald Trump is maybe a little more obvious for my. Yeah, I mean, now he's an, it's an interesting thing though because he's not obvious in some respects, which is that he claims, "Oh, I'm a businessman. I'm a very successful businessman." There's some doubt to that. Uh, he 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 presents himself as a businessman, as a successful businessman. And I think maybe that indicates some of the reason why objectivists, some objectivists are sort of taken in by that, that, oh, well, you know, he's more like her heroes because he, he's a businessman, he runs a big company. He's got lots of money. Um, although, of course, what I like to point out is a lot of the villains of Atlas Shrugged are businessmen, right? <laughs> uh, 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 um, I'm trying to think of the, the Oren Boyle and uh, uh, Jim Taggart and all these people, they're all like scheming crony capitalists. Um, but, but so in, a way, in the ways he's less obvious, uh, but I think he's more obvious in the sense that he is, he is more malevolent, I think, in his, in his approach. So I cast, I cast Joe Biden as Mr. Thompson, the head of the state. And it was, it's the style of it. I actually, I did some ill-fated work on one of the screenplays, uh, one of the Atlas Strike screenplays. It never actually made the light of day, but when I was trying to do sort of uh, Mr. Thompson's dialogue. And I was trying to figure out how do I get the style of this guy? How do I, you know, excerpting out the parts, what should I keep and what should I not keep? How do I, how do I get the rhythm of how he speaks? And I found it was really easy if I just imagined he was Joe Biden, that he's just sort of this, he's just, you know, he's, he's foolish. And like Joe Biden, I think he's also the man in the middle. That's how the time, the term I generally use for Biden, he's the man in the middle. Uh, there's a line in there. I think it may be used for, for a different character, Wesley Mouch, but it sort of applies to Thompson too, that he was the zero at the meeting point of opposing forces and he knew it and he never aspired to be anything else. And that's sort of Joe Biden to me, right? He is the zero at the meeting point of opposing forces. He's always been whatever the middle was given the forces at work, political forces at work in his era, he's been right there in the middle. So that's sort of how I view him. And then, you know, the fact that he's sort of gabbling and foolish and impulsive, which I think explains a lot about Mr. Thompson, actually, as a character. Um, you know, why does he have this, this, this giant banquet where he gives gold to TV audience? Well, because he's impulsive and he, he has these, he has these brainwaves, these great ideas that he thinks are perfect that are actually disastrous. That's very much Joe Biden's style. Um, but I, I don't know who's more obvious as a as a as a villain because she had a start interesting range of villains. Uh, one of the things I noticed about Atlas Shrugged that I found interesting is that she kind of has a collective of villains. Like there's no one villain. You know, in in the Fountainhead, you could say, okay, there's Ellsworth Tui. He's the the mastermind at the center of everything. Uh, even though there's you know there's a lot of different villains there, but he's there's we've one guy who's sort of at the center pulling the strings. What I found interesting about Atlas Shrugged is there's really, there's a collective of villains. There's no one, and it, it's interesting that it creates, there's no one satisfying moment at the end where you see the villain defeated. The villains just kind of melt away. Uh, and I think it's very consistent with her, her attitude and her sense of life and the philosophical theme she's working on, that they're not great individuals, they're a collective of small and petty individuals. And so when, you know, when they're defeated, they just kind of crumble to go away. There's no one person who's the, the center of everything, who's, who's organizing everything. Um, and that's how I think that, you know, when we talk about what an Ayn Rand villain is, there is this tremendous d d variety to her villains of different styles. And some of them are more the intellectual masterminds like Elsworth Tui or his, uh, uh, in Atlas Shrugged, his, his uh, Floyd Ferris is his, uh, he, he's the Elsworth Tui of the Atlas Shrugged universe. Uh, so sometimes you have a master, you have type, type as an intellectual mastermind, and sometimes you have somebody who's just, you know, a, a foolish sort of, um, you know, that zero at the meeting point of opposing forces who's just going with the flow, like Mr. Thompson. So you have this great variety of villains. So what is an objectivist? 
And I have in mind particularly the debate between open and closed objectivism. So I'll just preface this discussion by pointing out that I consider myself not an objectivist anymore because I think that there are some issues with Rand's meta-ethics. So I'm just saying, okay, it's a closed system and I'm outside of that system. But how are you viewing that debate, having found yourself in some disputes with various parties over this issue? Yeah, some disputes with various parties is a good way of putting it. Um, so I big of an example of that. So, uh, or let me, let me back up a little bit on this. So I view an objectivist as someone who agrees with the essentials of Ayn Rand's philosophy. Now, if you're a great disagreement with her, and I, I haven't gone into it deeply, I know, I know you, I'm aware of, uh, vaguely aware of your position, but not the details. Uh, if your agreement, if your disagreement with her is fundamental enough, then yeah, you should not, you, know, you should say, I'm an, I agree with a lot of objectivism, but, you know, and that's the objective way to put it. Um, I, but I think it has to be an agreement with all the fundamentals of her philosophy, but I don't think it has to be an agreement with everything. And that's the problem I have with the closed system. Now, the closed system tends to be now part of the problem I've had I had with this is um, I, I originally, you know, back when that idea of the objectivism as a closed system was sort of debuted circa 1988 or so uh, that I, I thought, oh, yeah, that's great, because, you know, at the time, I, I think there was an impulse in the movement to say, look, there were all sorts of people who were trying to sort of glom onto objectivism and Ayn Rand and her name and her reputation and her audience, and then bastardize the philosophy, essentially, to say, oh, well, you know, I have something that's like objectivism, except it's religious and, or, or whatever they were trying to do. And I kind of understood, especially as a sort of disgruntled 19-year-old uh, on uh, exposed to people arguing on Usenet, which is basically uh, nothing that happens on Twitter will ever surprise me because I was on Usenet in the 80s. And uh, so, you know, there was this like, Yes, we need to protect the philosophy from these people who are trying to, you know, sully it with uh, with two completely incompatible ideas. But I think that was a mistake to to, to make it a closed system because, for one thing, if you're going to close off the system, how do you close it? You know, you have to say, well, here are you can't say you have to agree with Ayn Rand on literally everything she ever wrote or said. So you have to make a differentiation of saying, well, you have to agree on the fundamentals, and and you know, and you 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 disagree on some on some non essential issues. Well what's the differentiation between the fundamental and the non-essential? Well, anything list, you could come up with such a list. I think you can absolutely come up with a list like that. But the thing is that that list isn't something Ayn Rand created. She never produced so uh, she never produced a list of here are the fundamentals and the essentials and here are the non-essentials. So in other words, basically to close objectivism, you have to, you have to personally yourself add something to it that Ayn Rand did not write. So you have to, and I think that's how it ended up working in practice really was, Objectivism was closed for everybody else, but it was, you know, there were certain people who were still alive and around, like Leonard Peikoff and people who proved by him, who were able to then say, well, this is what is, this is what's essential to objectivism. And even to say, well, I'm going to add something to objectivism. So, you know, uh, Leonard Peikoff came up with a theory on induction, uh, on, on epistemological theory on the nature of inductive reasoning. And sort of added that to to the philosophy, like so he gets to add things to it and new ideas to it, but only him and 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 nobody else. And so I think in practice it sort of became not that we have an open versus closed, but rather we have one person who gets to decide, a sort of a, a, a chief philosopher who gets to decide what's what's in the philosophy and what isn't. But the thing that really convinced me was was realizing that you know knowledge doesn't stand still. People are going to come up with new philosophical ideas and philosophical, they're going to come up with additions and refinements and even corrections on Ayn Rand's philosophy. You know, she was just one person. She could not discover everything there is to know about philosophy. And those, some of those are going to be useful enough. People are going to want to use them. And if you said, oh, well, you can't call any of those things objectivism, eventually what's going to happen is objectivism would have to go out of use as a term, right? That it would just be a historical term. Uh, it means, well, that's stuff Ayn Rand wrote, but you'd have all these things that are just like that in all the major fundamentals, but with additions and corrections that, that people find useful, that would have to then have a different name. And that doesn't make sense to me. And I think that I, I view it as we have a very good... Um, lots of good plain English common sense ways of differentiating these things when we need to differentiate them. So you can say, you know, this is Ayn Rand's view, or you could say this is the objectivist view, meaning that you think it's, uh, it is the, the one view that's, that's part of the essentials of the philosophy that, that is non-dispensable and unchangeable in the philosophy, uh, that it's, an, it's one that's essential enough that you can't just get rid of it. So it's the objectivist view, 
Or you could say this is an objectivist theory of induction or an objectivist theory of history, et, et cetera. So I think that you know, there's a lot that what, what really comes down to it is I think that there's a lot of plain English ways to do this that make a lot of sense if we wanted to use them. But I think that thing about the objectivism being open for some people and closed for others and having this sort of like some people having the authority to declare what objectivism is and other people don't have the authority to declare what objectivism is. I think that was the real center of this fight about open versus closed. It wasn't about what the philosophy is. It was more about who gets to say what the philosophy is. And I think that's why there was so much sort of blood on the sand over the years over that issue of open versus closed, because it was really about, you know, who has authority, who has control, uh, who has a position within the movement. And so the, the question of what is the philosophy and what is objectivism became tied in too much with the office politics of the movement. Is Ayn Rand a liberal? And this will give you a segue into your recent defenses of the term liberal, liberal and yeah. liberalism. Yeah, I'm actually agree, planning, by the way. Yeah, for, for so in Symposium, uh, my Substack, symposium.substack.com, got to plug it. Um, what I'm trying to do there, but by the way, the, the overall goal of, of Symposium is to try to bring together, so I see this moment where you have the, the nationalist conservatives, the anti-freedom nationalist conservatives on the right, and the you know sort of politically correct or quote unquote woke uh, uh, people on the left, and I'm seeing a lot of dissatisfaction on both sides. You have a lot of classical liberals who are very alarmed by and opposed to the nationalist conservatives. You have a lot of sort of old fashioned 20th century centrist liberals who you know thought liberalism was supposed to be about free speech. It's supposed to be about open, open debate. Who are very alarmed by the the woke and politically correct types. And so I saw this opportunity, let's try to gather those people together and get them to talk to each other and, and sort of try to make some form some sort of alliance or coalition there to replace the old fusionist one on the right. Uh, and so part of what I've been trying to do in that is to reclaim the word liberal, because the, I think we've got to, uh, it's, a, it's an old battle that, you know, I think some of the older conservatives gave up with long ago and they, you know, and a lot of us were like, you know, uh, probably you were like me, the, the college classical liberal who has sort of felt like the well actually guy, you know, well actually liberalism means, and nobody wants to hear it because they all think liberalism means, you know, a Michael Dukakis or whoever is running, you know, for the Democratic Party nomination at the moment. Uh, and so, uh, I think, though, we're at a much more auspicious moment for that, though, because the far left no longer even wants to be called liberals. They hate liberals more than anybody else. Uh, and whereas the, uh, the, the and then the right is identifying liberalism as its enemy, but identifying it in not as, you know, the, the pro welfare state people They're the, the new right, the nationalist right is pro welfare state itself. They're identifying liberals in our sense of people being pro-freedom as the enemy. So I think there's an opportunity to try to claim that label and get people to think that way. And, and in trying to do that, I always quote to people, uh, my favorite line from, from Ronald Reagan, this is from his Time for Choosing speech, the, the one that sort of came on the map nationally in 1964, where he says, you know, we're told there's a left versus a right, but it's not left versus right, it's up or down up to the maximum of freedom compatible with the rule of law or down to the ant heap of totalitarianism. So I like that outlook. I'm trying to get people to think in those terms. It's not left versus right. It's liberal versus illiberal. And then maybe try to realign people so that somebody, you know, somebody like me and somebody like, you know, Stephen Pinker or Jonathan Rausch or somebody like that, that we could view ourselves as being more allies than enemies to the extent that we're fighting for a liberal vision in the proper sense. Now you asked whether Ayn Rand is liberal. So I'd say yes, absolutely in that classical liberal sense. And I've actually, I'm, I'm, I'm working on an article that's title is going to be Ayn Rand comma liberal. Uh, it's gonna be trying to you know, send out to some of those people that look, you should take a look, second look at Ayn Rand because she's seen as this great conservative icon. And I, you know, pe people know I'm an Ayn Rand fan and say, oh, you're a conservative. No, I'm not a conservative. But the idea that, that she actually, and, and, and I wanted to spell out in that article, what are the specific intellectual things that she offers that are essential to a defense of liberalism in any, in any coherent and recognizable sense of that word? Well, it seems to me that the right, they used to say, oh, we're against liberals in the sense of welfare status Democrats. Right. But now it seems like it's become much more fundamental, like they're actually against classical liberalism and that, that whole body of ideas. Is that how you see it too? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's still... Um... 
it's something that's still sort of emerging from a subset of the intellectual of the intelligentsia of the right although i, I use the term advisedly with regard to these guys um because a lot of them aren't that aren't that profound of thinkers i mean i just read an article about uh, uh one of these nationalist conservative conferences and one of the guys there holding forth was curtis yarvin uh who is the uh immensius mold bug he used to uh, this weird name he used to blog under but he's like this this neo uh monarchist uh, critic of liberalism and everything i've read from curtis yarvin he, he, he has this huge influence and everything i've read from him and i try to understand what he's trying to say there's just nothing there it dissolves on contact when you try to actually say you know, it's, it's a bunch of very vague and and um unthought through ideas and it's basically a complaint that well there's a mainstream i was like well of course there's always been a mainstream you know there's a mainstream and the media is biased well you know we knew that in 1980 <laughs> none of that is new it, it, he seems to take this very obvious um observations about there being a sort of intellectual mainstream and, and you're looked down upon or ignored if you're outside the mainstream something that's always been true of and throughout human history takes this very obvious observation and then dress it up in this rhetoric that's both pompous and vague at the same time to try to make it seem like it's a big new idea. Uh, and really, I think they're trying to cover up the fact that what they're in favor of is authoritarianism, but they don't want to come out and say we're in favor of authoritarianism. So they that's why they dress it up in these sort of vague terms. But I think they're trying to sort of, there's a, there's a Trumpist Trump is really the excuse for these people. I mean, a lot of these were around, people were around before Trump. They were developing ideas before him, but they're looking for an authoritarian leader to will come and impose our values, quote unquote, our values, whatever value, you know, uh, impose traditionalist values by force. And they were looking for someone to take that role. And Trump came along and had an obvious interest in, 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 in that authoritarian style. Of, of presenting himself, even though you know he's a very poor representative of, of any kind of traditional or religious values uh, in his personal life. So I think there was that they were there is that sense of this small faction within the right that is very openly looking for a they're not they're not always admitting it, but it's they're very clearly looking for a way of justifying and and supporting and promoting an authoritarian outlook and. Um, now, I think one of the markers for that is the number of them who have been sort of sympathetic to or uh, at least anti-anti-Putin, right? And during, especially during the current war in, in Ukraine, uh, uh, that that's sort of a key marker for the fact that they they it, 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 they admire Putin. They look at him as a model for what they want to do. The idea of a, a strong man in the center who's imposing their values using the power of the state and, and giving them sponsorship. And uh, it's still a small faction in, in the right, but it is becoming highly influential, I think, because of the absence of really strong philosophical resistance. And here's what I think what's happened is that the, the classical liberal wing of the right is ideologically and intellectually weak and has not been able to mount a strong defense against this. And I think, the, and, and, also, you have the fact that electorally, you know, when you get out, there's always a difference between the, the intellectuals on the right and then the mass of voters and the mass of audience. Uh, and the mass audience tends to be motivated by very non-intellectual considerations. And so I think that the, the advantage that the, uh, the nationalist conservatives had, these anti-individualist conservatives, is that they're able to tap into the populist aspect of you know, conservatism can mean conserving the American political tradition going back to the founders as defined by these big ideas. That's the intellectuals version of conservatism. It can also mean a um, an attitude, an emotional level conservatism. I call it Archie Bunker conservatism, right? Which is, uh, now, you, those of us who are old enough to remember the uh, All in the Family, the show that introduced us to the character of Archie Bunker, he's this old crotchety blue collar guy uh, who doesn't like the kids these days, you know, and and he has this song, these things at the beginning of every episode, he and his wife sing about those were the days, you know, and it's this long, looking longingly back at the days when, as the song says, guys like me, we had it made. And it's this, you know, uh, I, I talked to Tom Nichols about this a while back, and he says, you know, at the time, it was this incredibly rosy, 
um, uh, fictionalized view of, of Archie Bunker's childhood because he grew up poor in the Depression. And this comes out in the show that he grew up poor in the Depression. Guys like him did not have it made back in the good old days. But it's this, this sense of longing that there was a, a time when I was young and everything was better when I was a kid. And Trump, boy, Trump really ties into that. Somebody described him once as Archie Bunker with money. And he, he, a lot of his rhetoric is back in, the, basically back in 1973, during his, whatever, whatever he sees as his, as his heyday, you know, back in 1973, when hair like that was young and sleek and looked good, uh, that, that things, everything was so much better. Recently, you hosted a discussion with Steven Pinker and George Will in which both sides agree that the welfare state is essential. Objectivists favor private charity. They even talk about a private safety net sometimes, but they oppose welfare statism. Why do you think that that is a stance worth defending? Well, okay, so first of all, I think it's a stance worth defending. I, I was a little disappointed, by the way, in George Wall. I wanted to put up, wanted him to put up some fight uh, against the welfare state, at least if only for old time's sake. Um, I think it's worth defending for a couple of reasons. One is that um, if you look at the federal budget right now, right, you know, nine, uh, the, the, by far the largest portion of the federal budget is welfare spending. Uh, you know, the, the old days of when, uh, uh, when President Eisenhower talked about the uh, evils of the, the, the danger of the military industrial complex, defense spending was like 80% of the federal budget, right? It's now more like 20% of the federal budget. And it's not that defense spending has gotten smaller, it's that everything else has gotten larger and is now, you know, four, four to five times larger as a portion of the federal budget. We're spending, you know, four or five trillion dollars a year, not on the, the core functions of government like defense or the police, we're spending it on welfare and we're spending it primarily on welfare for the middle class, which I think is very bizarre and perverse way of doing it. So if we're not analyzing that, I think, you know, uh, one of the things that I talk about in my book is that the people have come up with a concept recently that ties in almost like ties in very much to the theme of Atlas Shrugged, which is the concept of pathological altruism. And the, you know, their version is not quite her version, their version is, well, there's a version of altruism where you're, you're wishing the, 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 you're, you're in, in wishing well to somebody else and trying to do good for somebody else. You actually do it in a pathological way and cause more and cause pro more problems for everybody. Uh, they also call it toxic charity, right? So this is the idea. So sort of like being the best, I think the strongest example of the, is this is the sort of the codependent person in, in, uh, for an alcoholic, right? The person who helps out the person with an addiction and the help basically consists of making it easier for the person to stay addicted and to stay in this self-destructive cycle of action. You feel good because you've helped the person, but you've actually, you know, not helped him with his the real problem that he con confronts in his life. Um, and so Ayn Rand's argument, though, was that altruism as such is pathological. That it, you know, the the idea of of saying of of putting all of your um, uh, putting all of your, your your moral worth in the idea of sacrificing yourself to help others. At the same time, it also means that those other people are not encouraged to do the things that would make their own lives fulfilling. You're, you're basically making everybody helpless. What is it? The uh, uh, Ellsworth Tui in the Fountainhead says, uh, you know, no one has any thought except for the good of the next person next to him and nobody and who has no thought except for the good of the person next to him and all the way around the world and, and all will suffer and none will enjoy, right? So everybody's sacrificing their interest to somebody else and nobody is actually doing anything to make themselves happier. Um, so she argued that altruism per se was, was pathological, that it was destructive, that, you know, and I, I think that we have to focus on the positive case for an egoistic outlook and egoistic ethics, which is the basic function of life is to go out and to create the things that you need to live and to enjoy. That's what every functioning uh, um, uh, living being does. It goes out and creates the, you know, the, the things that it needs in order to survive. A bird builds a nest, uh, an animal hunts for food, uh, the, a cow grazes the field. You go out and you achieve and you create the things that you need in order to survive. And then when you've done that, you go out, you do more and you do better and you, you know, you go to a higher level of achievement. And that has to be the baseline ethically of any system that we have. So the baseline can't be what if you're totally helpless and can't support yourself and uh, you need help charity from others. You know, that does happen, but that can't be the baseline. 
we have to remember the, the, the baseline of, of human life is you going out and choosing some line of work and going and creating the things you need to survive. And then not just to survive, but then to prosper and to grow and, and, and work on a higher level uh, as, you, as, you, as you gain more knowledge and more skills and, and build up your capital, et cetera. You can go work on a higher level. So that has to be the fundamental of human life. And you can't have a society built around or a government built around the idea of, well, really, you're all just permanently helpless and incapable of doing anything. And your best interest is to be a ward of the state. And that's why I think that the, the middle class welfare state is particularly seems crazy to me, right? Because it's like the wealthiest people who have ever existed in all of human history, the great, the great American middle class, the wealthiest middle class, largest and wealthiest middle class that has ever existed in all of human history, being treated as if they have to be dependent on the state. When we're the, we're the people who have the least need to be dependent on the state. And then on the other side of that, is and you know what it really just means is our own money is taken away, taxed away from us, and then given back to us, uh, minus you know a cut for the middleman. Uh, now on the other side though, but what about the people who actually are poor? I think the the path, we need to have more attention to the pathologies of the welfare state. Um, part of the so part of this analysis of pathological altruism, uh, re- done by some psych- psychologists recently, is the idea that altruism itself, altruism as an idea, becomes so associated with morality, it becomes unquestionable, and you can't even study it or think about it or or raise any doubts about it. And I think that's what's happened to the welfare state. And the consequence of that is we have welfare state policies that we implement for decades on end that are supposed to end poverty that don't actually end poverty, but we can never touch them and we can never change them because altruism and the welfare state have become synonymous with morality itself. So you can't possibly, if you want to, re- if you want to reform welfare, you're, you know, you're, you're pushing grandma over the cliff in her wheelchair. Uh, the famous ad that was done uh, uh, against Paul Ryan, because he went to do some, you know, so he went to do some tinkering reforms with how the middle-class welfare state was, was, uh, was funded. And therefore you want to push granny over the cliff. So it becomes something you can't question it, so you can't even point out or, or notice its deleterious effects. And I think you know, the biggest problem is we have a welfare state that, that, that breeds dependency. It breeds the idea that yes, you should look at yourself as a victim. You should look at yourself as somebody who naturally should be supported by the state and who shouldn't be out there you know, gaining the skills and, 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 and seeking work and finding a career and doing the things to support yourself. And so you end up with a perpetuation of poverty long after I think it's really necessary. Uh, The thing I've noticed in the last decade or so is they've sort of redefined poverty and say, oh, no, we've, 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 we've totally, uh, we've, we've done, made great strides in reducing poverty. If you define poverty to mean how much money you have when you include government benefits. Well, if you are, you know, if the majority of your income is government benefits, you're still poor. You are still in a state of poverty. You're just poor plus being dependent on government. So it's uh, I, I go back to what uh, Lyndon Johnson said at the beginning. We said the goal of the welfare state is not to make the poor more comfortable in their poverty, but to help them, you know, join us on the high road to uh, to prosperity. Well, he didn't. The welfare state didn't actually achieve that goal. It made the poor more comfortable in their poverty. It did not. Uh, for the most part, did not help them go out and you know acquire jobs and and join the middle class on our pursuit of prosperity. So I think that you have to be able to have somebody out there questioning that and pointing out the pathological altruism of it. Um, and I'm 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 actually very I, I'm disappointed that today's conservatives have kind of given up on that. You open your book. You do not need a reader's guide to Atlas Shrugged. Why did you write one? <laughs> okay, so I said you don't need it, you know, on the on the grounds that it's not like uh, James Joyce's Ulysses, right, which is this novel that's famously obscure, or I think it was, uh, maybe it was Finnegan's Wake. There's somebody who wrote a, uh, one of the other James Joyce books where somebody uh, wrote this whole book, a, a guide to Finnegan's Wake to, to, like, to decode all the different things in it because on its own, it's incomprehensible. So Ayn Rand was a clear writer. She had plenty to say, and she, she said a lot of it in the novel. So uh, you don't need someone to just help you get through the book just to comprehend it. But my goal on the, in the reader's guide was to say, okay, there's, a, there's deeper layers of meaning here. And there's, you know, there's a lot of philosophical content. There's a lot that can be drawn out 
uh, to give a deeper understanding of it and, and also a more accurate understanding. So part of my sort of side goal in writing the book was all the common misconceptions out there about Ayn Rand. So for example, one of the, uh, one of the chapters is all about this idea that, well, Ayn Rand loved rich people and she hated poor people. And then pointing out that, well, in Atlas Shrugged, you know, most of the main villains are, are rich. And in fact, the, the main villain, Jim Taggart, boasts at the end that he's probably the richest man in the world. Whereas a bunch of the, uh, uh, a bunch of the heroes, most of the heroes in the novel end up at some point giving away or passing up, a, a, a leaving behind, abandoning a, a fortune and going off to, you know, to work at a menial job instead. So, you know, it's, it's very much not what people think. I, I think people come out with, at with like certain conventional categories of you're either this or you're that, right? You're either, you're either a welfare status who loves the poor um, and, or you're, you're uh, a, 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 rich, a, a rich jerk who hates the poor. And, you know, you, you have to put somebody into one of those categories. It's one or the other. And she's often orthogonal to those categories and doesn't fit into them. And so part of it is to drawing out ways in which she doesn't fit people's normal expectations and is challenging those normal expectations. To what degree are Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, and Elon Musk Randy and heroes? Okay, so I'm working on, I want to talk about Elon Musk in particular, uh, because I'm actually writing something about him. It's going to be called, who is, who is Elon Musk, right? So, because uh, I find him a maddening character. I think I, I describe Elon Musk as a, uh, my, my line on him is he's, he's an Ayn Rand hero as rewritten by Tom Wolf. Uh, <laughs> because uh, he, he, I, I used to describe him as a greenwashed Ayn Rand hero because he has that, a lot of those same elements of like the visionary, uh, the visionary engineer with these brilliant ideas, brilliant futuristic ideas, and everybody doubts him and he goes and he shows that the doubters are wrong. And so there's this sort of Ayn Rand hero aura to him. Um, but at the same time, I find it maddening because he had, there's also an element of attention seeking and flim flam that I think is why I say Tom, as rewritten by Tom Wolfe, because, you know, Tom Wolfe, one of the themes of his novels is, and of his worldview, is the idea that people are motivated by prestige and status and, you know, how they appear in the eyes of others, which of course is totally different from the motivation of an Ayn Rand hero. But I see that element in Musk, that there's a certain level of attention seeking uh, and of public, being a publicity hound. And a couple of years ago, I was doing a, a, a technology a, a, a technology blog, sort of emerging technology, the stuff that's five to 10 years out. You know, so basically fusion, is it 15 years in the future like it always has been? Uh, <laughs> uh, that sort of thing. And, and often has it evolved waking up and saying, okay, what did Elon Musk say today? And was it brilliant and visionary or was it complete flim flam? And you could never really tell ahead of time. Uh, so stuff like the Hyperloop, which is com you know completely in, in, in unfeasible, or a million people living on Mars, again completely un unfeasible, not realistic in, in the least bit, um, uh, and and very so he does various things that are that are 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 clearly you know just there for publicity to 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 create the aura of being the visionary billionaire. But at the same time, he goes out and he, you know, creates reusable rockets. Or right now, I'm talking to you over Starlink, which I'm extremely happy to have because it's like 50 times faster than what I had before as a rural internet connection. So he creates this amazingly, you know, and, and Tesla is sort of a mix of the two. It's, it's a really cool electric car. It's also about $30,000 more expensive than a perfectly good car of, of equivalent quality you could get. And it creates things, he does things like says, oh, we're gonna have full self-driving, which he has no idea how that's going to happen. It's, it's there, you know, he, he advertises, you could buy this package that will make it compatible with full self-driving, but they're not even close to having actual full self-driving. So again, it, everything he does is this mixture of genuine great accomplishments and flim flam. And that way I sort of put him more in, he seems more like a character for the fountainhead, if you wanna put it that way, which is, you know, in, in Atlas Shrugged, it tends to be more like if you have a businessman who's a genuine achiever, he's consistent all the way through. You know, he's consistently first-handed all the way through. In The Fountainhead, you get characters more like Gail Winand and some of the other people who are magnificent achievers in one aspect and then second-handed in some other aspect, you know, publicity seekers or, uh, you know, flawed in some other aspect. So he seems like more of a mixed businessman character to me. Uh, so if he were an Ayn Rand character, he would be in The Fountainhead and not an Atlas Shrugged. Um, 
I, I don't know enough about Bezos and his personal life. I, mean, I think you know, Amazon is obviously an enormous achievement. Uh, Bill Gates strikes me as uh, a guy who was very brilliant in his business, but is just tremendously conventional in his thinking when it comes to anything outside his business. And so, you know, I, I think that going back to this issue that that the Ayn Rand heroes in Atlas Shrugged, because of the themes she was trying to build up, the, the businessmen heroes tend to be more unmixed. They tend to be more consistent, that they are uh, consistently rational in all aspects of their lives, or at least trying to be consistently rational in all aspects of their lives. Whereas I think of the Fountainhead, she had much more of these characters who were brilliant in business, but then deeply flawed or gone off the rails in some other respect. Uh, and I think that, he, he, the, that a lot of our billionaires today are more like the characters in The Fountainhead. And that's actually a more realistic uh, portrayal of a lot of the wealthy people that they, they're people who are absolutely brilliant in the area they're working in, uh, in the area that they make money in but oftentimes very conventional or, you know, uh, out of their depth when it comes to, uh, you know, their politics or their, their view of life. Do Ayn Rand's heroes have a streak of stoicism? <sighs> Objectivism versus stoicism is an interesting thing because the Stoics had, you know, had some really interesting things to say. Um, the problem with, I, I would say with that is actually, so I, I just recently reread The Fountainhead and we had to sort of with some friends had a series of discussions about The Fountainhead. And the one new thing I really got out of it, uh, or there are a couple of new things, but one of the big new thing I got out of it was the extent to which self-betrayal in The Fountainhead is often portrayed as a form of emotional repression. And especially with Peter Keating, and you know the, if, for you, if you know The Fountainhead, the relationship between Peter Keating and, and Katie, his, his girlfriend, uh, that she's like the one genuine thing that he loves for, uh, firsthanded for himself in the world. And he keeps having, and, and she, both of them, those, both those characters keep having these feelings for each other. And also these feelings about Elsworth Tui, that they've said there's something wrong or malevolent about him. But of course, in conventional terms, they're supposed to revere him. And they keep repressing their feelings. And a huge part of their problem is that in repressing their feelings, they're repressing essentially their own values and the voice of their true self. So I think it's it's a kind of a, uh, a misconception of Ayn Rand that she was about repressing your feelings. And that's more where the, the Stoics had some great stuff to say about reason, but they tended to view the suppression of feelings as, you know, the Stoics are sort of the models for the Vulcans in Star Trek, right? Yeah, you know, the idea that you, you, uh, you, should re, you should repress the emotional side. And it, it comes at least in, in some versions of Stoicism it comes from the fact that this was a philosophy that flourished among Greeks after they were conquered and in some cases literally enslaved. Right? I think it was Epictetus who was a slave. Um, and so the idea that you know, as a slave, you had absolutely no control over your life, no, absolutely no, you, know, you were not master of your own fate, you had absolutely no control over anything that happened in the world around you. And so therefore the only thing you could control was your emotions. And therefore, sort of tamping down and not wanting much of anything and, and being satisfied, even in, you know, uh, I think it was, I think it was Epictetus who said, you know, he could maintain equanimity even while he was being beaten by his master, uh, that he could maintain this indifference toward it all. That's sort of the, 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 the part of stoicism that, you know, that, that's how we use the word stoicism to mean this sort of endurance of pain and, and suffering. And that's what I describe as, as the difference, you know, the big difference, uh, with, with objectivism. So objectivism has this idea of, of uh, an element of, of putting reason first. And sometimes that does mean, you know, uh, Ayn Rand's heroes are often proud of how much they can endure uh, in terms of work or suffering or hardship, that sort of thing. But at the same time, you know, she was also a tremendously emotional writer, right? Uh, that these are characters with very deep and powerful emotional lives. And um, I mentioned before that a bunch of her characters in Atlas Shrugged give up a fortune. Uh, uh, and, and the way I summed it up was all an Ayn Rand hero really wants is love. Because when you look at it, it's often, it's romantic relationships and, and or personal friendship relationships, like with, the Frank, with uh, Francisco D'Ancona and Hank Reardon. It's these relationships of personal friendship or romantic relationships that often are the things that drive the plot. So, you know, she did, she, there's an element of stoicism in the idea of reason over the emotions uh, or reason being primary over the emotions and of being willing to endure great hardship in order to achieve what you want. 
but there's also in Ayn Rand this idea of you know a vibrant emotion, a vibrant and, and powerful and extremely dramatic emotional life, um, and of the idea that you know there's some very incisive things, especially in the Fountainhead, about this the idea that that self renunciation and self destruction can take the form of emotional repression, emotioning uh, repressing what you really want in life and what your real values and 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 desires are. Here's what just occurred to me. It seems like stoicism, they don't want anything in life to affect you mentally. And Rand is superficially that way on the negative side, but it's more like we don't let the negative stuff reach us too deeply because we're focused on positive values, which is the opposite of stoicism, at least as how some people um, construct it. So in a way, she's anti-stoical um, in that sense, and that she's so, yeah. it's like you're so focused on your positive values that the negative stuff of life is never really gets to, gets to the fundamentals of your soul. Yeah, in, in The Fountainhead, she talks about a pain that only goes down so far. Right, and yeah, that's the line it, that was. And actually something that I, in, in talking and writing about John Galt as a character. So, you know, the title of my book is, So Who is John Galt Anyway? And it was sort of basically, that was the one of the chapter titles where I was saying, well, let's look at the details on this character of John Galt. And one of the things that that comes out is he has this, I said, you know, in today's term, we would call it Zen-like, even though it's the, op, you know, it's, it has nothing to do with Buddhism. But this, he has this sort of imperturbable calm, this sort of serenity with which he deals with things. But a serenity that comes from basically having such a, a, a tremendous understanding of, of, of how the world works and of what, what's happening. And, and you know, he goes to this, uh, he's able to see the, co the, the consequences and causes of everything that's happening and therefore able to accept, even when there's a setback, he's able to accept, okay, I understand, you know, he has this mental control over it. And I think that's sort of the, it's this ideal that Ayn Rand is, is holding up and, and Howard Rourke has that in the Fountainhead of this sort of serenity, this inner serenity and this ability to, to deal with the setbacks and misfortunes of life in, in a calm and uh, 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 contemplative or thoughtful kind of way. And I think that's what makes her heroes actually quite interesting. And I actually talked about how um, I, I think you, it, there's a lot more to be said and written about how it is you can actually achieve that because it's sort of an ideal that she projects onto her main characters but there's a real question of like in real in the real life in, in the real world what are the steps you'd have to go through to be able to actually live like that and have that mentality and that mindset uh but it's kind of an ideal that she has that you that uh, it's the idea that you you would understand the world in such a way and accept the world as it is in such a way that any setbacks or problems would be seen like that, you know, the pain only goes down so far, you'd have a certain equanimity about it of understanding, well, this is unavoidable. And I could, I should, I should just deal with it as, you know, I should, I should, I should accept this and deal with it. And a lot of it goes back to this supreme confidence he has that he can mm -hmm. reason him what himself out of any problem. And basically like he could be reduced to nothing, no, to have all of his physical possessions taken away. And he would still be very confident that he can build his life back up. And I, I guess a yeah. lot of it, and you talk about some of that in your book, and I, mm -hmm. I guess a lot of it has to do with that is this confidence in your ability to use reason to improve your immediate world for the betterment of your life. And it's a confidence in, in, the, in one's mind and one's ability to use reason, but also, you know, Ayn Rand was very much a sense of life writer too. So it was also a confidence in your spirit, in your ability to find the energy and motivation to 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 rebuild and to and to keep going from wherever you are uh and uh yeah something i've been wanting to write more on at some point is this idea of what she talked about the benevolent sense of life the idea that the universe is uh, you know essentially the universe is uh she calls it the benevolent universe premise the idea that the universe is open to you that the universe is a place in which you can live and succeed in which success and achievement is possible and so that even when there are setbacks, you still have the confidence that something is possible and I can keep going. And, and the psychological impact of that as this, you know, it, it's something that's in the spirit of each of her heroes that she's setting forth is the idea that all of them have not just, you know, great minds and intelligence, but they have that sort of energy and confidence that I can go out and achieve what I want to achieve in the world. And even if it's all taken away, I'll just, I'll just build it back up again. So it, it's not just intelligence, it's also that sort of energy of the spirit and the confidence that the universe, that the world in which we live is a place where you can achieve things. 
And I've been wanting to write more about that because I think that's is psychologically very powerful and this incredible source of, of energy and enthusiasm. Some people complain that Ayn Rand doesn't talk about parenthood. Of course, there are parents in Atlas Shrugged, including a mother in the Valley with her, I think, two children. Yeah. I know a lot of objectivists who have children. And of course, a lot of objectivists are extremely interested in education and pursue that as their career. How does Rand's view that love is earned in some sense fit with a parent's unconditional love for their young children? Well, you're asking the right guy because I have two kids uh, uh, about whom I, uh, I like to talk a lot. Uh, so you know, you know, the thing is, uh, ch- parenthood and childhood doesn't have that huge of a role in, in Ayn Rand's novels for two reasons. One is I think she was not herself a parent and her, uh, her, uh, her not, I mean, she deals with family relationships most actually in We the Living probably, which is the more, the more autobiographical novel, which is really about it's based on her experiences as a young woman in, in St. Petersburg after the revolution. Uh, so you have, you know, she, she, she's able to write about what it's like to be a child of parents, but she, you know, her, her novels actually do tend to reflect her experiences in some ways, you know, so the fountainhead is about young artists and intellectuals uh, trying to make a career in New York in the 1930s, which is exactly who she was, you know, five year the five to 10 years before she was writing it. Uh, or Atlas Shrugged is more about the, the you know, she has this best-selling novel. She goes out and she meets Bennett Cerf and all these, you know, big intellectuals and, and businessmen. And then she writes a, a novel that's sort of set in those, in that, in that setting. So I think she didn't write about parents and children as much because she was not herself a parent and the, you don't have the intensity of material to write from. Um, but as a parent, let me talk about that. So, uh, The love you have for a child when it's first born is a love for this thing that you have created. It's literally come out of you. It is, it is a product of, uh, of your creation, and it is pure potential, right? <laughs> it's pure. You, you are thinking about what this child may become. Now, not in that sort of, you know, you're going you're gonna to become a football star, son. Uh, not in that sort of vicari- living vicariously to your kids kind of way. That You don't want to say you have to do this or you have to do that. But it's this pure potential they have for everything that's going to happen to them in life. Um, and then, of course, as, as the child grows, the child has a specific identity. It, it has particular characteristics. And um, I mean, unless you can, you know, there are probably people, you know, who have to struggle with this, who have like, you know, if, okay, so Ted, you know, Ted Bundy's mom is going to have to worry about, okay, my son's a serial killer. Uh, how do, do I, do I still love him? Is love really that unconditional? Um, but for most of us, you know, whose kids are not uh, serial killers, there's, there are specific characteristics about these kids that you grow to love. There are specific things about their sense of humor, their way of approaching the world, um, there are these experiences that you have together that are uh, uh, that that are remembered fondly by both of you. Uh, that become you know my 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 kids are now my sons are now twelve and fourteen, and you know the the we have they're they're friends of mine in a way. It's it's, it's I don't want to that sounds wrong because it's like deeper and more intense and personal than a friendship because you spend way more time with your kids and you have this whole experience of what they were like when they were very small. But there's so many interests that we share and so many experiences we've had together that form this parent-child mold. So the idea of saying, well, it's unconditional. Well, I wouldn't say it's unconditional. I would say it's conditioned on this whole history of experience that comes with, you know, me being in love with his mom, with their mom, right? And me being in love with, with their mom and saying, we have such a great relationship, a wonderful life together. We want to share it. We want to have kids. And then having the child grow through the womb, I mean, there's this whole context of experience that bonds you to that child in all sorts of concrete and specific ways from, you know, before he's born up until, you know, whatever the current uh, current age he's at. So um, it's not unconditional love. It's love that's conditioned on this whole very intense, very detailed, involved set of, of, of relationships and experiences you have with the child. And that's, that's what the bond is. Um, you know, if, uh, and so I, 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 I bristle at the idea of calling it unconditional love. It's love that's conditioned on real things. And of course, you know, 
Uh, fortunately, my kids do not show any sign of the homicidal triad and are not likely to come and turn out to be Ted Bundy. So I don't think I'm going to have to worry about, you know, they may do things I disapprove of. They may, you know, uh, have ideas that I don't agree with, whatever. All that's going to be, you know, the small stuff on the outsides. And the core of that is going to be this, you know, this time during their childhood and all the experiences we had together uh, that were so immensely enjoyable and fulfilling for, for hopefully for both of us. I have a six-year-old, so all of that resonated with me a lot. I thought that was a good answer. So, uh, you should look up. I, my wife and I, I, occasionally I get a chance to co-write something with, with my wife, Sherry. And we were, did a piece a number of years ago, 2015, I think it was, called 10 Amazingly Enjoyable Things About Having Kids. And it was sort of arguing against this idea that, that having kids is a sacrifice, that it's altruistic. I mean, you hear this from conservatives sometimes. And basically saying, no, it's not altruistic at all. It's a hell, hell of a lot of fun. And so we, we go over some of that. I haven't seen that, so I'll look that up. I'll yeah, put it in the it show notes too, by the way. Yeah. So this will be the last formal question. Sure. Should we be optimistic or fearful about America's future? Ah, okay. That's a good, interesting question. Um, I think we should always be fearful in the, in the short term and optimistic in the long term. That is, there's always lots of stuff going wrong. So every time I, I find myself saying, well, today we have a, you know, this, in this current environment, we have a uniquely difficult challenge. I, I think back, you know, one of the benefits of being uh, a little older is uh, the benefits of age is that I can think back to all the other times I probably would have said that, you know, 10 years ago, uh, 20 years ago, uh, 30 years ago, all the other times that would have seemed like that. And I, I, I can, you know, I can remember, I think the last great moment to be a pessimist was 1979. And I'm just old enough to have a distinct memory of, of what that was like, you know, gas lines and the, the Iran hostage crisis and the Soviets are invading Afghanistan. And all this, you know, huge number of things going wrong in the world. And, uh, you know, and, and plus, you know, it was the 70s. I mean, you know what people were wearing <laughs> and the music they were listening to? It was everything was going downhill, right? So um, I think 1979 is like the last moment at which you could be really a hardcore pessimist. Um, and the thing is, there was so many moments like that where things, there have been dangerous and their dangers have always been real. That's the thing is that the dangers have always, it's not that people were wrong to be worried about the Soviet Union or that they were wrong to be worried about bell-bottom pants or, or disco. Uh, it's, not that, it's not that none of those things were, were problems or were bad or were a threat. It's that people kept fighting against it. And, and there was all, you know, that, that people were not passive in the face of the problem. Um, and so I think that, you know, we have the problem as I see it today is this thing that you have, the left has gone very openly illiberal with, you know, the, the politically correct, the woke crowd, which is, you know, back, back in my era, political correctness was in the universities, everybody, everybody else made fun of it. Now it's come out of the universities and taken over this whole swath of elite uh, institutions. But at the same time, you have the right that's become openly liberal and rejects Reaganism and, and fusionism of the past. And so we have these unique set of, um, of, of threats. And that I also add to that, you know, one thing I want to, I've written about here and there is I think we have a lowbrow culture, like a militantly lowbrow culture. This has been sort of the death of the highbrow that's happened that, um, that, that, uh, it, you know, in my, my, my plan for the culture war is that culture wins, right? That, that no matter what people's values or ideals are, that at least they're producing great art that would embody that. And there's not enough of that happening. Culture is losing in that respect. So there's all sorts of problems. But at the same time, again, there's been so many times in the past when there were all sorts of problems and people uh, have rallied and, and found ways to, to create something and solve the problems and, and make our way through to the other side. And suddenly you, you uh, I, I, the thing that shaped, the experience that shaped me is I was about 20 years old. I was in college. I was not paying attention to the news. I was spending a lot of time in fifth century Athens <laughs> in, in, buried in my books. And I'm walking down the street with a couple of friends and somebody says, Oh, did you see on TV last night where the Berlin Wall came down? And so imagine that they just they keep walking and I'm just standing still with my mouth hanging over. I'd say, the, the what did what? <laughs> but it was this thing that, you know, here was the Soviet Union, this great threat for so many years. And then one night, suddenly, poof, the Berlin Wall goes down. And it was just inconceivable. But that had a big impact on me in the sense that you have these threats and dangers that you're fighting against over periods of decades. And eventually, if you keep going, if you keep fighting, you outlast them, and they and 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 you you go on to find some new problem that everybody can get their hair on fire about. But um, it, it's that sense that over the long term, I think that uh, human beings will rally, they will find solutions, they will try to hang on to what's good in the world, 
and have done so for, for so many, so over so many years <laughs> that, that it, it makes me optimistic for the future. And I'm actually, I have a book coming out now uh, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, it's a series of essays that got me in a lot, hot, lot of hot water in the objectivist movement when I wrote it. It was called What Went Right? And it was basically trying to explain, uh, accept the reality of progress and of things going right in the world, and then try to come up with an explanation that is, it's my correction and reverse addition to Ayn Rand's theory of history. So that's what got me in trouble as I was adding something and you know, uh, opening up her philosophy and adding something to it. Um, but it's an attempt to explain that phenomenon of, of the fact that, that people will solve the problems and uh, come up with new ideas and will and things will go right and then trying to explain how it is that that happens okay great well i would argue that disco is objectivist i quote ah ah, ah staying alive <laughs> but uh, in addition to your book coming out what else have you got on your uh, on your plate what are you working on well people should check out trzinski letter uh, it's trzinski letter .substack i moved everything to Substack because i was i was cobbling it all together myself the back end of things and and it was much inferior um uh, that that's sort of the clearinghouse for everything. I've got uh, I've read a regular column and regular pieces in Discourse magazine. I'm occasionally show up in Quillette, uh, in the Bulwark, a number of other publications, um, and I've got uh, a, a book on it's basically a defense of individualism that I'm working on. Uh, that's sort of an answer to the uh, to the illiberal right and their attacks on individualism. Uh, and uh, like I said, this new book uh, called What Went Right that's coming out is those old essays sort of gathered together so people can have them in a uh, easily obtainable form. Uh, and check out my book on Atlas Shrugged. Uh, so who's John Galt anyway? But uh, trzinskyletter.com is where it's sort of the clearinghouse for everything that's being published elsewhere will be announced there. Okay. Well, great. Thanks a lot for all your great work. And I really appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks for having me on. I've, I've enjoyed it. <laughs>